happiness. What is the role of this word in your life? Does it signify a goal, a choice, a state? Does it resonate with you? Perhaps you find terms like fulfillment, purpose or meaning more useful. What about your relation to melancholy, to sadness? In what ways are happiness and melancholy connected? And if they converse, what would they say to one another? These are some of the questions I'll contemplate with Dr. Ibrahim Almarachi. I originally recorded this interview during my times at a university. I now bring it to you so that we can become more intimate with these terms and perhaps discover novel ways in which they can shape our human experience in a wiser manner. Ask yourself this. What is it in your life without which it would cause you to suffer? And if you have that answer, then you found your passion. For me, it's teaching. That is my passion. Without teaching, I would suffer. Now, but this is the funny thing. Okay, so I found my passion. And that means I found my happiness. I know what my passion is. But here's the irony. Okay. Finding your passion won't end your suffering. It will give you something to suffer for. So you see now where I've come. I've talked about I found my happiness, but at the same time, my happiness causes suffering. Dr. Ibrahim Almarachi is a visiting professor at a university and an associate professor at the California State University of San Marcos. He holds a PhD from Oxford University on the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. As you listen, perhaps the fact that Ibrahim has had such a close relationship with pain and suffering made him the perfect expert on the sappiness spectrum. I'm Carlotta Gitch, and this is The Waking Youth Podcast. The first question I have prepared for you in the spirit of the Happiness Week at the IE Center for Health, Wellbeing and Happiness is, do you think that to start with happiness is actually a useful concept? I believe happiness is a useful concept if you conceive of it the way Aristotle defined it. For Aristotle, happiness was not happy feelings. Mm -hmm. It's something much more profound. Mm -hmm. Happiness is about human flourishing. Uh, so in other words, it's now being happy all the time is, am I, uh, have I found that which allows me to flourish. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's a bit surreal being here a year after I gave that lecture on happiness for Happiness Week last year. Because while I gave that lecture talking about what the great thinkers thought happiness was, ranging from Joseph Campbell to even Nietzsche mm -hmm. had profound thoughts on happiness, I kept on thinking, these are all great ideas. If only I could internalize the, that advice and make myself happy. Uh, when I was giving that lecture in the middle of it, and I, I'm not sure if the, the Happiness Center has it uploaded. Uh, mm. Perhaps they do. There's a call in between the lecture where it was my uh, ex-girlfriend. And uh, I forgot to turn my phone off, but I, re I remember picking up the phone and saying, you'll never guess what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about happiness. And she laughed mm. uh, because I, I, I think one of the reasons the relationship didn't work out was I had difficulties in those times finding happiness. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm here today. Uh, that lecture I gave on happiness was based on my expertise, not on happiness, but on melancholy. And really what I realized with that lecture is I talked about happiness as a state to achieve, mm -hmm. but I, I think we need to start at, that might be a goal, but let's talk about sadness as well. You can't know happiness 
unless you know sadness. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that entire lecture was really addressed to me. Mm -hmm. I hope it helped others. But that's all I was able to do that day was elucidate new ideas about happiness. Uh, and even though I ha find it hard to incorporate their advice, I, I was wondering, maybe do other people have difficulty? I wish I asked that. I, I, I didn't. So that's really what I'm here for. It's to maybe get this dialogue going. Mm -hmm. Not so much about in the discussion with you about giving advice. I'll try to do that or fix this because I haven't found those fixes. I'm the mm -hmm. worst person to give advice. But I am a person uh, as a professor. I, I just want to tell the students. Uh, I can empathize with you. Yes. Perhaps I'll touch on this again later on in the conversation. But I do remember being in that event. And then right after that talk on happiness, you were giving another talk for some other event at IE about some crisis management. Am I correct? I don't after, remember what it was. But I, I thought that was cool. You're absolutely right. After that talk, I gave a lecture on uh, a group of predominantly Asian women who were killed in a hate crime. Oh, wow. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the subjects I work on uh, are depressing. Mm. And uh, since really I began my PhD, uh, so we're talking about more than 20 years ago, uh, I've uh, really the... Where I'm covering Iraq, mm -hmm. life in Iraq under Saddam Hussein, uh, two topics that I feel passionate about, such as that uh, discrimination. Uh, so it was surreal, talking about happiness to talking about something that was so depressing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. And seeing a good number of people in the audience go from that talk on <laughs> happiness and jump into the Zoom link for that subject. Yeah, and that I guess that's also why the human experience and the human condition are so fascinating because we can very quickly go from one spectrum to the other. And, uh, and that's what I want to talk about is to talk about happiness and sadness as a continuum mm -hmm. rather than two sides of a coin. You know, we're yes. expected to be happy one side, one another, and uh, the other side. I, I want to talk about it as a continuum. Okay, so having in mind that you do research and study and talk about uh, in your classes about some very harsh and heavy topics and also knowing now how you feel about the, the usefulness of the concept, how would you begin to define happiness for you? Okay, uh, so I'm going to do a very Taoist exercise okay. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've, uh, I would say you can't know happiness unless you know sadness mm -hmm. and we tend to forget when we're talking about wellness Wellness was a term that was conceived to be the opposite of illness. Mm. And so uh, what I want to do is then conceptualize happiness by talking about sadness. Mm -hmm. Just as we can't know wellness without knowing illness, I want to do the same with happiness. So my argument today is, you know, let's not think of happiness and sadness of two sides of the same coin. You know, either it has to be heads or tail, right? Mm -hmm. Let's not think about that way, but as a continuum. Or let's just create a, a word to kind of get across how I conceptualize this. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it as sappiness. Sappiness, <laughs> yes. okay. Yes, okay, so let's combine <laughs> them. So, and I'll, I'll tell you how I, I came to this conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we, again, continue with Aristotle's definition of happiness as being a matter of human flourishing, I define happiness as when you found your passion. Okay. Mm. So not in terms of happy moments. I, I think that's where we're, lead, you know, usually we take something to reach a happy moment. I think you are in a state of happiness, okay? a continual state of happiness when you found your passion. Mm. Okay. Now, then a student always asks me, Professor, I haven't found my happiness because I don't know what my passion is. So then I say, let's do this exercise. Okay. Ask yourself, you know, what is it in your life that gives you meaning? Okay. And then again, if they have trouble with this, I, I take another example from Aristotle, and then we could take another example from Jesus, <laughs> and I'll tell you how they're uh, connected. Okay. Uh, so Aristotle's, uh, of course, uh, key contribution to philosophy was this notion of a telos. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And uh, basically, a telos is defined for this. The telos of an acorn is to become an oak tree. Mm -hmm. okay. What is your telos? And the, again, if you have trouble asking this, then let's go to Jesus. And let's think about this term passion. Okay? Because when they're talking about the passion of Christ, okay, what do they really mean? I want you to think about that. Because when we talk about passion and passionate, okay, are they saying Jesus was a passionate lover like those characters on the telenovela? No. The word passion originally comes from Greek. And, you know, even in Italian, when you say bon pasqua, what, what are you saying? Well, that word originally comes from Greek. It means suffering. Okay. So, in other words, let's define how to find your passion. Okay. This is my definition. Using that wordplay, ask yourself this. Okay. What is it in your life without which it would cause you to suffer? And if you have that answer, then you found your passion. Okay. For me, it's teaching. Mm. That is my passion. Without teaching, I would suffer. Now, but this is the funny thing. Okay, so I found my passion. And that means I found my happiness. Mm -hmm. I know what my passion is. But here's the irony. Okay. Finding your passion won't end your suffering it will give you something to suffer for. Mm -hmm. So you see now where I've come. I've talked about I found my happiness, but at the same time, my happiness causes suffering. Okay, I'll give you some very good examples. Uh, so let's say if my passion is teaching. It is, when I say teaching, it is having a group of students in front of me, and there was never any doubt about it. Even during summer, when a good number of professors take the summer off, no, I teach summer schools mm -hmm. from June to August. I, I never stop because that's my passion. That's what brings my happiness. Uh, take COVID, for example. And uh, when COVID began, I was on leave from my normal job in San Diego at Cal State San Marcos. I was te that's when I began teaching at IE. In that case, you see, COVID caused me to suffer, you see. Because all of a sudden, in the middle of the semester, I no longer had access to my students. And you were a student at IE during COVID, when COVID first broke out. Not only did I not have access to the students in my classroom, I didn't have access to just the students walking around the Segovia campus, nor the students walking around the uh, Madrid campus. That's when I was suffering. Mm. And uh, if you remember this awful program, I won't mention its name, this awful program that the teachers had to use. It wasn't Zoom. Okay, but it was a program that promised to connect us. It was really disconnecting um, yeah. us. <laughs> and that was when I was suffering the most because not only did that program was very unreliable, I couldn't see the student faces. Mm. But you see, uh, just because classes, you know, maybe start to resume in person, it doesn't mean my suffering ends. I'll, I'll tell you when I suffer as well. I put my passion into teaching. But when I see that students, let's say, don't respond, don't have the same passion, mm. their faces are glued to the screen, that also causes me to suffer, you see. So do you see? And that makes me sad. Mm -hmm. And so there we go. Uh, and I, I think that describes these kind of, um, what I'm saying, happiness is not necessarily about moments of happiness. Mm -hmm. It is uh Finding what gives you happiness, but at the same time, acknowledging that it could cause you suffering, and thus sadness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that I used to use the word passion very lightly and very often. And then I did some research on the origin of the word, and then it was associated to the suffering of Christ. And then I began to notice how it was very used very lightly in our culture. But I guess it's very interesting what you're proposing because it is admitting that dimension of suffering that is essential and that is um, a reminder that what we care about will also bring us suffering. It's the, the wholeness of the human experience. Like our families. Uh -huh. Yes. Especially, I mean, they bring us happiness. But yeah, mm. of course, when we lose relatives, uh, as, you know, as you did, mm. uh, it brings, you know, 
their loss or their their separation. As uh, you know, uh, I've known since I've traveled most of my life away from my family in California also causes us to suffer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go now again to this concept of happiness. And you have touched on this concept of passion, and it seems to also match the this concept of purpose, having a, a reason for for getting out of bed, something that you really care about, that implies suffering a lot of the times. What would be for you some of the other shadows that we don't often talk about when we talk about happiness, but are perhaps useful to talk about in order to truly live a happy life as much as possible. <laughs> I, I like how you chose the word shadows. That's very poetic. Mm. Because uh, if, uh, think about it. Sometimes we need shadows to find shade from the scorching sun. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the danger is we choose to stay in the shadows. Mm. And sometimes getting out in the sun is what we need at the same yes. time. And I, I think that's a very apt metaphor. The shadows, the darkness, the blackness. Uh, which I want to talk about today is melancholia, mm. which I I'm going to use that term instead of depression. Uh, just uh, uh, because it's a condition I know very well. It's a state. Let's put it this way. It's a state I know very well. So, you know, for students who are um, listening out there, I, I kind of want you to appreciate... Uh, that, you know, we could live lives just like you guys. Uh, we can, you know, we s have Gossip Girl lives. Oh, I shouldn't have used that <laughs> reference because I've just given away I know what Gossip Girl is. But yes, I feel, I, okay, so I've seen it. I, I felt the plight of Lonely Boy, but I'm not sure if I ever got my Serena Vanderwoods in. But anyway, <laughs> no, what I mean by that is just even the simple things that might you make you upset. I get upset when I, a woman I like, for example, I see her with another man on Instagram. These very simple things. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of the simple shadows. But the, I mean, for me, the greatest shadow I'm living in uh, was, uh, you know, growing up in California, our house was kind of like a refugee camp for our relatives who are escaping Middle Eastern conflicts. Mm. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, a, it wasn't, I mean, this whole idea of acknowledging trauma, I'll tell you, it was, it was a couple of years ago where I heard a song from my favorite childhood cartoon uh, that triggered something inside me. Instead of bringing a lot of good memories, mm. I, I uh, started crying uncontrollably. And, you know, curled into a ball in the fetal position. The minute I heard that song, uh, one of those uncles who lived with us, I just rem I started remembering how he used to beat the hell out of me when my parents weren't out there. For no particular reason, nothing I did wrong. It was, he, he just had a very cruel personality. Uh, that uh, set me on this journey where I'm in front of you today. Uh, because uh, that's when I had to seek out therapy. But mm -hmm. what I do as an academic, of course, was this therapist was very academic as well. I, and I think that was probably his strategy, was mm -hmm. to make an academic realize the benefits of therapy, mm -hmm. uh, have me study the subject as an academic. And I did. And, and that was, if I, I could say, not only the benefits of therapy, addressing this trauma that I had suppressed, but learning about figures such as Viktor Frankl, whose book changed my life. Uh, um, books by Eric Fromm, for example. Reading about Freud or Carl Jung, all of that work uh, helped me a lot. Uh, so uh, let's, if I talk about uh, one condition, it's this. And it's a funny thing when talking about happiness. The minute I'm having a happy moment, I just say things are too good. Mm. And I find something. What, so let's say what's going wrong. This is what I'm going for. Things are too good. Let me. It's like I'm um, um, on the shore of happiness. Mm. And then I dive into melancholia, that mm -hmm. ocean. And so let's talk uh, about melancholia for a minute. And I prefer this term to depression. Okay. Why? Even uh, Just because it's, uh, we, because we put, the word depression was such a stigma. 
Hmm. And I'm not saying they're more or less the same thing, but if, if it helps to have the dialogue and conversation, let's just call it melancholia. Yes. I prefer this term because it's a historic term. Mm-hmm. And I, I say for anyone who's kind of worried about talking about this generally, then let's say melancholia because it puts you in the footsteps of the ancients. Mm. It puts you into kind of one of the four humors. Now, in the past, melancholia was considered a calamitous humor. Okay. Now, if you, if you don't know, the old medical um, conceptualization of what's wrong with you was you had four humors. If you were had an affliction, you, there was an imbalance with one of your humors. Melancholia was called, it was believed you had too much of black bile. Mm. Okay. And the word mela in Greek means black. Right, mm-hmm. so let's. That's why I like the term shadows because it reminds me of the black and melancholia. Okay, so let's. When I say to anyone listening out there, w- melancholia puts you in the footsteps of the ancients. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, the great art historian Vasari believed melancholia what was is what made artistic genius possible. Mm. So for those of you who are struggling with melancholia. I want you to think how perhaps this condition does give me some kind of, puts me in the footsteps of uh, the various artists that Vasari was describing in his great work, The Lives of the Artists. Mm. Uh, basically, he was arguing it made one more sensitive, uh, it, uh, that it was a product of one's use of fantasy. Mm. And then uh, continuing with the Renaissance, there was this, uh, gr- this great humanist, the Neoplatonist uh, 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 Marsilio Ficino, uh, where he said basically, uh, yeah, melancholia was um, a mark of genius, okay? And that um, it, may, it, it was essential for to have an artistic and intellectual passion. And let's go from Vasari to Ficino to Bob Dylan. Hmm. who said in any beautiful work of art, there was some kind of pain behind it. And so that's, that's why I prefer that term, because it puts me in good company. And for hmm. those of you who kind of feel there's maybe something, a stigma around talking about this, think about it according to these three uh, personalities. Okay? I see. There's this, I'm, I'm intrigued by the work of Elizabeth Gilbert. Okay. Um, and she wrote this book on big magic. And she talks about the creative process mm, okay. of, of writers and artists in general. And she does touch on that uh, perhaps somewhat romantic idea that an artist uh, needs a dimension of pain in order for his work to, to be meaningful and to be uh, genius. And she kind of challenges that idea, saying that you can be an artist and you can also be light, light hearted. Uh, So while I do feel like there's an important, important message in what you're saying of when we are courageous enough to look at the shadows, to look at the uncomfortable things, we are touching on human and universal, probably universal experiences. So that's why those works are genius because they do touch on something that is deep, deeply truth. But at the same time, there's also a danger that we stay there too much because that pain is, can be also addictive. So how would you begin to talk about that? And how would you, what would you say is the ideal point for us to actually use these, these states in a productive and useful way? I think she's a good example because mm. it, it's getting to my uh, to my conclusion. It's that but think of all the pain she had endured mm. before she went on that transformative journey. Yes, and the thing is with that pain, okay, with that melancholy, is not to accept it. And so the, the next part in this process is, is saying, "I acknowledge the pain now. There's nothing wrong with me. Other people have dealt with it." But think about her most famous work. Think, would we know Elizabeth Gilbert were it not for the personal pain she endured in her life? Okay. Think, mm. eat, pray, love was this. She's saying, I'm feeling this. Now, what can I do about it? How do I use this pain and transform it? Yes. And I think that grand tour of hers was this. So uh, that's the caveat is once you recognize it, think, how can that trauma, how could that pain make me find a passion? Mm. And I, I think that's the key lesson 
is, if she had a happy-go-lucky life, think about it, we would not know who Elizabeth Gilbert mm-hmm. was. Uh, think about how many people she transformed with her story. Mm-hmm. And because it's the minute she acknowledged that pain, she says, let me find a way to transform it and tell a great story. And I think that's, where, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. So, yes, she, I haven't read Big Magic. I will now. But I, I, I think she is a very good example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess that big magic is is really helpful, especially for creative blogs. Uh, but I resonate a lot with your words, uh, precisely because it seems like she made her passion about overcoming mm-hmm. the suffering in a uh, not uh, innocent way, but sure. in a graceful way. And so I think it, the key word is how do we manage? Mm. And so let's go with the, I, I think at the end of the day, whether we're talking about Elizabeth Gilbert or other great works mm-hmm. where people talk about their trauma, there's always some kind of management of this. And so why I think is the word management important? Because I, I, I take it from another subject I teach, which is conflict management. Notice I don't use the word conflict resolution. Okay. And there's a reason. Uh, because conflicts rarely get resolved. Mm. Okay. The best we can do in our life is manage our conflicts. Uh, and so I, I think with kind of like our feelings of, let's say, sadness, depression, melancholia, I don't think they ever get resolved. Mm. They get managed. And I think in the management, that's where we could find our passion. Mm. Uh, where we could find uh, our experience that not only will transform ourselves, they'll transform others. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about Elizabeth Gilbert, uh, she managed her conflict. Mm. I'm not sure she will ever resolve it because the past is her past. It's part of her, all Mm -hmm. the things she endured. Okay, She managed it. So what's the difference? Uh, So let's think of conflict, right? I mean, usually we let's think of the traditional sense, how I use it. Uh, Conflict is usually... A conflict between two parties. Mm-hmm. Notice I don't say two individuals. I say two parties where one seeks to control the other. And the minute you try to control and there's resistance, conflict emerges. So let me just pick a very good example. Just let's speak of a conflict between individuals on campus. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember this day on Segovia, in Segovia, uh, where there was these a couple of students having lunch. And uh, they didn't remove their tray from the table. And one of the women who I've known, who works behind the counters in the cafeteria in Segovia, uh, came outside and screamed at them. And uh, God bless this woman. I've known her since 2008, the, when Segovia, the, when the university was first founded. Okay, there you have a conflict. Mm. Okay. This woman wants them to move their tray, but these boys... I hate to say it, they're, they're, they, were, they looked very pico. Uh, they, or, I, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. But now their toxic masculinity was at mm. stake. They cannot do it because they would seem weak because now everybody in front of the cafeteria was looking. So what happened at that moment was this student from communications, what did she do? She intervened and moved the tray. Because those boys weren't going to do it. The, this woman was very agitated. She was the third-party mediator. Okay, and whether we're talking about the UN, okay, or a, a therapist in the uh, couples counseling, or this woman, do you see the importance of the third party mediator? That's what a therapist does. You see, because we think of conflict usually as between two people, a group of people, or nations, but I would argue the greatest conflict is within ourselves. Mm. When I say two parties, it's usually us versus our internal judge. And so the best I could, we can do is to manage that conflict with our inner voice. And I think that's where uh, therapists come in. Or just simply books that teach us to transform that in, inner voice. That's what I mean by conflict management. So what are, you know, you could choose little strategies to manage that conflict you have with that inner voice. Because if that inner voice is the source of your melancholia. Uh, the shirts I wear. That usually have very bright flowers. It's it's usually, it's a purposeful strategy. It is um, because if melancholia is the color black, I usually avoid black for a reason. Because mm. not only does it cheer me up, hopefully, I, if, if I find people, mm. maybe it cheers them up. Um, 
I, I remember this little boy at the cafe who used to uh, just always come up to me and say my shirt was like a walking garden. And it was. <laughs> and often I joke. So if you could imagine it, I'm wearing a shirt with flowers. I have a vest. But I used to often say, and yeah, there's a little bee in one of the flowers and it's trying to get out. But don't worry, I'll protect you. So how do we manage? So I think we have to look for these strategies. And I, I think um, if I could just say a couple of strategies. Okay. This is what I recommend. So don't think of them as advice. But this is uh, some of the kind of strategies is this. Um, if you feel, let's say, pain for somebody or if something is a kind of you have a platonic love for them, if you yearn for them, don't think of that person as causing you pain if they're out of your reach. Just think, be grateful that that person was in your life to begin with. Okay. Now, when I say platonic love, it could be somebody who you're attracted to, but it could be, f how do you deal with death? And this is, I mean, when I lost my grandfather, so I know what you went through, uh, it took a lot of bad relatives mm. to make me appreciate my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm going to miss him. Nothing will take away the pain. But I'm just so grateful that I had the grandfather to love in the first place. Mm -hmm. Even if you're attracted to this person, this person's out of reach due to circumstances, be grateful that this person crossed your path in the first place. So that's one. This is the other major strategy I use, is what causes me sadness or what causes me misfortune? How can... Can I spin this? Whatever bad happens to me, how can I say, okay, this has happened to me? How can I find the benefit for this? And it doesn't come immediately. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come immediately, okay? It might take you a long time to realize this was bad, but there was this fortune that came out of it. Um, one of the ways, uh, COVID. <laughs> how can I spin COVID? How was that bad? Okay, it was bad. Uh, but then it led to the emergence of new technologies that mm. allowed me to continue teaching at IE. Okay, mm. Remember when I said my education was interrupted because of COVID? But then I, I lost uh, you know, my ability to teach you guys. But then it came and allowed me to teach you much longer than I could have ever imagined. And that was a good thing. And then finally, what is that one thing that nobody can take away from you? You see, when I'm feeling depressed, I try to think, is there one thing you did in your life that no matter how bad you're feeling, nobody can take away from you? Mm. And for me, it is. There is one thing. And th that was finding a long lost relative. Mm. Such a long story. There's no way I could tell it in this particular <laughs> podcast. But that story of finding a long lost relative, I found her. Nobody else did. Mm -hmm. And now she's part of my life. Uh, and... What I do with that then is try to share it with as many people as possible during COVID, okay? Mm -hmm. Because really finding that long lost relative was about a pandemic. You see, we, I mean, we, I mean, I'm sure, think when the latest round of Omicron came and people kept on thinking, what if this will be over? That was nothing like the tuberculosis pandemic. A much deadlier disease. It's literally mm -hmm. called consumption because it consumed your insides, your lungs, right? And so what I do with that story that nobody can take away from me, what I do is often I would cancel, let's say I would say a class in Segovia or Madrid, uh, let's have class outside. And I tell them that story. Or what I do is often I take groups of four students, uh, invite them over. Uh, Nata's talk with you was very profound because she said, what are the good things I could do after dealing with all her issues? What is that one act of good? And so it's that, as I take that story and share it with as many people mm. as possible. To share that story of tuberculosis, love in the time of tuberculosis, if you will. <laughs> uh, have them come over, sit on my couch. Think of it as Freud's couch, but it's, it's a different way I'm telling them the story. It's not the patient on the couch telling them the story, but vice versa. Mm -hmm. Those are the ways I manage the shadows. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sitting with your strategies. I found it intriguing what you said. I don't know if it was while we were recording or before that, but you were sharing that the therapist that you visited was familiar with the academia and very intelligent in how he approached you. And it seems that at the end of the day, what you are talking about is also of applying our intelligence to our inner world which feels like um, 
a very productive thing to do because at the end of the day, it helps us gain some distance from our experience, but also look at it almost like a case study as a historical phenomenon. And I think that awakens curiosity and a certain motivation to really explore this experience and perhaps help us gain courage to look at the more dark parts of ourselves. Exactly. Um, <laughs> excuse me if I'll pause here for a second because, um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, and that courage. Mm. I, I, I think that's the key word. Um, because when I, okay, uh, how I came to be sitting in this chair in front of you, it's when I first went into that therapist's office, I thought it was a failure. Mm. How embarrassing. Look at look how low I've fallen. Mm. Um, and uh, the first person, I mean, so I, I, I think this is, and I highly recommend uh, if you're listening to this, to listen to Nata's uh, podcast, because she was the first one who had the courage to talk about this publicly, where mm. I said, if she can do it, I can too, you see. And again, speaking of that experience on the sofa, was, and, and my sofa <laughs> is where I had four students, one being Elias mm -hmm. and the person he was talking to, where she was so open about talking about her experiences with therapy. This is where the students are teaching me, whether it's Natalia, Elias, or that unnamed student. When they were talking about it, I was like, okay, if these students have the courage to talk about it, then I, it's it's my duty as the professor mm. to say, uh, if professors are sometimes, I, I don't know how students feel about professors. Some they might loathe, maybe some they hold in high esteem. <laughs> but in that case, if some might hold me in high esteem, then I, I decided, okay, if these guys are talking about it, let's use COVID. Again, let's take the misery of COVID, the darkness has caused us, and leverage it, manage it, if you mm. will. What strategy can we use? to talk about things that some of us might never have talked about. You know, all this drama I had with uh, the therapist, that was pre-COVID. Mm. But if, if I was saying if COVID can cause some good things, let's manage it, leverage it. And I think one of them will be a final recognition that while dealing with this pandemic that's caused by viruses, let's also deal with that pandemic that's called the mental health pandemic. Mm. Let's finally address it. I think that if, that, if there's any one kind of silver line of the cloud, uh, let it be that. Mm. The next question is precisely about this: these two topics of the health crisis that we're facing, but also many other crises <laughs> that we're facing and um, our mental health. And I guess I'm going to elaborate a bit here uh, because you do deal a lot with students and something that I... It is my experience, and I have briefly and profoundly discussed it with friends, is that it seems that at times we're facing double reality in that on one hand, we are in an active process of developing ourselves personally and professionally, uh, starting our careers, thinking intentionally about uh, finding a love partner, building a home and engaging in public life. But on the other hand, there are all of these crises happening in the world, political crisis, COVID-19, climate change. And it feels very overwhelming to deal with these two at the same time, which sometimes when you are in the second reality, it almost feels like, what, what motivation then do I have left? So I'm just curious to listen to your thoughts, because from an historical point of view, it feels like this has this. It seems like there's always some kind of crisis uh, so I'm curious about your perspective, both, I guess, personal and more historical. <laughs> sure, absolutely. You're right. There's always been a grand crisis. Uh, so think whether, as I mentioned, the previous pandemics, tuberculosis, uh, the pandemic uh, that we called the Spanish flu, the influenza pandemic that began towards the end of World War I. There was World War II, which really seemed like the world was going to end. The Cold War. And uh, where it seemed the world was likely going to end because of nuclear annihilation. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, this is different mm. uh, because 
uh, this particular pandemic and climate change, I think, are linked. Mm-hmm. So sure, there's been historical calamities, and this is kind of like the toxic positivity that uh, that tactic that's told to your generation. There's always been a great crisis, mm. you know. Uh, get used to it. No, this is something different from How a historical so? perspective. Climate change really has the potential to end life on Earth as you know it. And I'm pointing to you, your generation. You see, with the the nuclear standoff, we knew as long as the two world leaders who had their finger on the button, as long as they didn't press that button, there was a chance for life. Mm. This is a much darker uh, uh, threat, I would argue, climate change. So that, uh, I I mean, I don't think anything in history has been like this. Mm -hmm. I think what your generation is facing is something much more dire. And uh, and uh, what can we do about it, you see? Do you see how frustrated I'm getting about it? But mm-hmm. I think that and I'm doing that again because let's practice my conflict management strategies. So, no, your generation is facing something unprecedented. Uh, I mean, you're, the film of your generation, I'll, I'll tell you, the film of the generation of the, at least in the kind of the Western world during mm-hmm. the nuclear standoff, either you was the... Um, uh, the Terminator series that dealt with nuclear annihilation, right? But you knew that as long as the buttons weren't pressed or as long as we didn't activate the computer system that set off nuclear annihilation, that was the end. Yours is really don't look up. When I saw that film, I was like, that's the film that captures the zeitgeist of your Mm -hmm. generation. We see the problem and there's just this willful ignorance. So what do you do? So let's, uh, let me bring it back into focus because yeah, when we're talking about COVID, uh, you've, how many COVID tests have you taken? You probably can't number. Lost- you, we really, I, I think with every COVID test is there needs to be a mental health test to also ask, are you okay? Mm. I, I think that's what we're forgetting. And this brings us together. You see, COVID is combined with a mental health crisis. And I think that mental health crisis is one of anxiety because anxiety is the fear of the unknown of the future. Mm-hmm. And that's what climate change portends mm-hmm. to us. Uh, Dealing with, so how do we manage our fears of climate change? Uh, I'll tell you, how do I manage it is this. I write a lot about it. Mm. Because it's it's what I ask myself. As a professor, what's the best I can do about it? What's in my capacity? Uh, I'll I'll tell you back in September when there was a march for climate. uh, When I was in Madrid, there was this march for the climate. And it coincided, and then there was another one in December, coinciding with the various conference of parties that uh, that year was held in Madrid. Mm-hmm. Okay. And a student asked me, "Does any of the what good does these marches do?" I did it, but what good does it do? Okay, this is the answer, and it's the same answer I give for anyone who goes to the women's marches. Okay, do you think going into the women's march will really end patriarchy? Something so embedded, it won't. Do you think going in these marches might end climate change? Okay. Unfortunately, let's be realistic. Maybe not. Okay. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm. That's what that's what I say. Uh, when I write these articles, do I think it will make a difference about climate change? Uh, no. I do it because I think it's the right thing to do. And I won't give away the ending of Don't Look Up. I highly recommend it. But this was the thing. Did the main actors, Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, as scientists, and, you know, of course, there was a time, uh, I won't give away too much of the plot, uh, where Leonardo finally came to realize how bad the situation was. Did they do everything they could possibly do to warn the people about the comet? Which is both an analogy for climate change Mm -hmm. and COVID. They did. And at the moment when they're having their last supper, okay, and if you look at the scenery and rewatch it, think about how it's very mimics the last supper, okay? It was the same like a lot of people, at least Jesus, he did everything possible in his lifetime Mm -hmm. to spread his message. That's what I tell you, okay? Because uh, to be honest, a lot of the things about climate change do the activism because it's the right thing to do. But again, there are voices, important people who are going to have to make changes. Really, it, it feels frustrated because to know they aren't the ones listening. Mm-hmm. They aren't the ones looking up. Mm-hmm. But do everything you do 
not for waiting for the results, because that's what we're usually trained to do. I do something, I want the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Do it because it makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. Do it because you know you've exhausted every potential in yourself to make a difference in this regard. Yes, and now if we go full circle back to the concept that you brought of happiness, of purpose, of um, finding your passion, uh, then you can make doing the right thing your passion. And that m might actually bring you to life and bring you a tremendous sense of you doing something meaningful with your life. That's how I find solace, solace in these times of hardship. <laughs> it, it, exactly, because, you know, the, the things I'm most, or not things, the persons I'm most passionate about are my, you know, two nephews and my niece. Mm. And I think about their future and, you know, how they're kind of really living in an age of anxiety. Um, and... That's what really I hope, you know, one day they, they, they'll listen to this podcast. And uh, because it's, it's tragic to think. They, the, when I grew up as a teenager, I, I didn't have this existential dread of there is no world that I might be living in because of the uh, transformations that are occurring. For me, it was actually quite the opposite. It was quite a upper. Uh, optimistic time. The Cold War had ended. It was the age of globalization. It was on the eve of 9-11. But when I came of age, that was an age of possibilities. Mm. The future is going to be a better place through globalization. So all I can say is I, I could give you the coping strategies I do, and it can, might lead you in dark places the way the world is. But hopefully what I offer you is maybe tools to manage mm. the, the times we're living in. Yes. Thank you, Ibrahim, for all the insights. And it was a pleasure to have you here. It was a pleasure to be here. And I'm sure it will not be the last time. <laughs> yes, let's, let's, uh, I look forward to coming back. Thank you. My pleasure. Waking Youth is an independent podcast and newsletter that you can learn more about at wakingyouth.substack.com. Our theme music is composed and produced by Carlos Sierra, who also edits our episodes. And I'm Carlota Gitch.